It's casual, not formal. It's hosted by Rory Pendlin. Oh, and Renee in tow. It's time to start the show. One, two, three, go! <laughs> Welcome to another episode of It's Casual, um, a very special episode today uh, for two reasons. One, this guy is incredible. He's a rock and roll star. He's played with, oh, so many bands. We're going to try to talk about all of them, hopefully in, in the next uh, hour. Uh, and uh, it turns out, I'm reading his book. Let me show you his book. It's the Joey Huffman story. Uh, East of the Sun, Memoirs of an Accidental Rock Star. Let me tip, tip that down so you can see. Um, uh, I'm reading this book, and all of a sudden I come across a, 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 a chapter uh, on a group called Hijinks, which was a, a rock and roll group that I knew in, in my hometown, Lake City, uh, 1982, 84. It turns out that this is Joey, the keyboard player from that band. He went off to Atlanta, and just his career phew, skyrocketed. He took off. Um, uh, let's bring up Renee Worski. Hey, I'm excited. This is Joey Hoffman. He's done everything with every oh one. God. Hank will, and, and like, let me tell you, let me tell you how diverse he is. Okay. okay. Obviously, Soul Asylum. Now yes. he's with Hank Williams Jr. Driving and crying. CeeLo Green. Yeah. Are you kidding me? Yeah. And he looks, and he looks like a rock star, but he's like really humble and a nice guy. That's what I've been hearing. He's like really <laughs> down to earth. That's why his memoir has the subtitle Accidental rock star very because, humble. yeah very humble person very nice yeah. and a rock star you would actually uh trust with your kids you would trust them in your house it wouldn't come oh, out looking like <laughs> <laughs> he know. looks very he's very trustworthy he's very, i think he's a very trust he's a mensch that's what i'm hearing he's a mensch uh be before we bring him up we do have a video from another rock and roll star we're doing oh yeah this is quintessential rock and roll right here watch this guys Hello, it's me, Benji Smalls from Heavy Metal Missile. I just want you all to know uh, that you guys are bloody lucky to have Joey Huffman on your show. He is the rock and roll cat's meow, as we say. I mean, he is true rock and roll, man. I mean, he's a good keyboard player. He's an awesome keyboard player. He's an awesome musician. He can play guitar, flute, whatever the hell you throw at him, he can do it. But let me tell you something. That's not what rock and roll's about. This bloke knows how to freaking party, mate. <laughs> we had some good times together, Joey. I'm looking forward to seeing you again, mate. I really am. And I still got your coat. <laughs> so yeah come and see me sometime soon mate love you bro take care have a fun time on it's casual they're good people sex drugs and rock and roll he always has to end with that <laughs> he has to end with that and you know that. i hope that joey gets his coat back that looks like a really sweet coat leopard skin yeah. Yeah. I, I bet it's made from the skin that. of an actual leopard that Benji wrestled. That's what I feel like. <laughs> no, no, that was Joey's coat. He said, I'll <laughs> oh, you that's coat, right. Man. Sorry. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> oh, my God. All right. So let's let's bring him up without further delay. Mr. Joey Huffman. Hey. Yes. Wow. How you doing? Looking very Tom Petty there. <laughs> I like well, that. He's looking Joey Huffman there. He's yeah, looking Joey Huffman there. I like yeah. that. I, I bought the hat and I, I haven't been able to give it up. I wear it. I wear it all. Where did you Where did you get the hat? Got that hat online. I can't. Are you serious? Yeah, it, an ad came up on Facebook, and I said, "I want that hat." And I got that. It's very Mad Hatter, very Alice in Wonderland, and yes, a little Tom Petty. It looks awesome. It's fantastic. Yeah, you, you ordered on Facebook. Wow, you were taking your chances there. <laughs> well, you know, I get wild sometimes. <laughs> That might be the most wild thing you've ever done, Joey. And yeah, you've done some wild, wild things. things. You got some stories. 
Yeah, I'm not afraid to to order with my credit card. <laughs> <laughs> hey, this is Joey Huffman. <laughs> Um, how many instruments do you play? I got to ask you right out of the gate. Um, you play guitar, a lot. Bass, keyboards, uh, mandolin, um, wow. tin whistle that I bought in Ireland that, that I learned how to play. Uh, I played okay, but that's about it. Okay. I, I thought I'd read somewhere you played flute as well. No. That no. was Rick you're thinking about. <laughs> Rick, Rick plays yeah. flute. Yeah. Uh, I, I was mentioned at the beginning of the show, High Jinx. Uh, this is the band that I knew you with. This was your early days, 82 to 84. And uh, uh, Rick Rick Seymour, who's also in Atlanta. Oh, you say all the guys are in Atlanta. Yeah, all the guys are in Atlanta now. Mike yeah. and Bubba and Rick. Yeah. Uh, try, I, I, I tried to book Rick on the show, and we had a double booking, and I, 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 never, got him, I never got him to agree to come back on the show. <laughs> huh. So... I'm hoping to get him back on the show. Hopefully he'll see this and he'll he'll realize I'm sorry. I, I'm sorry I double booked. Hey um, Rick. Hey <laughs> the hey to Rick. Um so yeah, High Jinx was a, yeah, there were there we go. There's Rick and you. Uh in the early days. High Jinx, uh you, you went off to Atlanta to make your way on your own and uh wow, your career just skyrocketed. Yeah. Um, I came up here to play with a guy named Ian who was in a band called five miles high. And we ended up, I ended up getting another gig. I can't remember if it was Isaac Hayes or, or whatever, but I turned him on. He played with the outlaws. Then he played with Leonard Skinner. And, uh, uh, I hadn't seen him for a long time. And, uh, I thought he was mad at me and, and he comes up and hugs me. He says, man, I gotta thank you for getting me that outlaws gig because it, just exploded into everything and i was i was just doing a favor for a friend i didn't know that, that was gonna you know turn out for him the way it did but i'm happy it did it atlanta is a hub for entertainment um it's it's kind of like new york for rock and roll uh <laughs> i mean new york's cool i mean it's it's good too like for theater and stuff like that but and, yeah. and you've been to new york a few times doing gigs but Absolutely, yeah. But Atlanta is a hub for, for entertainment and for, for music. And Athens, Georgia, too. Athens, Georgia, which is about 90-minute drive. Absolutely. I played there a lot, too, with Michelle Malone and Drag the River. and. Yeah. Uh, Michelle Malone uh, worked with Bill Berry of R.E.M., correct? Yeah. She worked with him. She She's worked with everybody. She's yeah. uh, doing great for herself. And uh, CeeLo Green, of course, Atlanta. So yeah. that's another yeah. hub there, um, another connection there. How did you meet CeeLo? I'm a huge CeeLo fan, so I just got to know how you got um, how you got acquainted with him. My friend Britt from Blackberry Smoke had a studio, and he usually recorded there, but he called me. I had a studio uh, with mm -hmm. Jeff of Jackal, and they said, CeeLo's going to come up and check out the studio. Well, we it, it was at 10 at night, and, and we said, okay, you know, so he comes, and he comes when he comes, he just starts loading in. He's ready to record. And uh, he wanted a piano solo on something. And I said, well, I guess I can do that. And so we just started recording. And and, and uh, I recorded the piano on Follow Me on, on his record. Ended up co-producing and playing on that record. And we did it all at that studio. Wow. Uh, one of the songs nominated for a Grammy, uh, Getting Grown nominated for a Grammy and, and uh, uh, we worked for about a year uh, on, on that record and probably had about 75 songs recorded. So CeeLo is noted for being very persnickety and he's a perfectionist. It's very, I mean, he turned down Pharrell Williams happy. I mean, Pharrell Williams wrote happy for CeeLo Green. CeeLo did the, the demo of it and said, ah, I don't want it. And Pharrell ends up getting this big hit with it. So my point is that CeeLo is very persnickety. There's something in you where he was able to work with you. To got, me, that's a huge honor. We got along great. And he wow. had a very good work ethic. If yep. he had the right lyrics, I would just loop the part, you know, and he would sit there and he'd write lyrics and finish it. And we'd finish stuff. Like I said, we, we overdid stuff. We did like five songs that are all backed up to DDS3 dat tapes now. Uh, uh, but he was a he was great to want to work with. Uh, he was he he. 
I had no problem with him at all. He was, uh, I was that right there with him. You know, we, sometimes it was just me and him in the studios. Really? Wow. Yeah. That's a lot. That's a very intimate relationship when you're recording with somebody, you get to know somebody on a deepest, on a deeper level than most social interactions. How would you describe CeeLo, CeeLo as that? You said great work ethic. Hey, um, great work ethic. Stories about him that. He's just a talented singer. He sang. We had probably 15 tracks of vocals on every song, him singing from high to low, all the different parts and, and rapping. And uh, there were always like 16 vocal tracks. He's a very, very good singer. He's very oh, good. Amazing. And good vocalist and, and very, he could rap, you know, off the top mm -hmm. of his head, write it out. And he's just a really talented guy. I never worked on an R&B record before, and, and first one, and, and had a great experience. It was, uh, it was awesome. Awesome. Now, uh, in your book, in the beginning of your book, you go back to uh, you were actually working not just as a keyboardist for bands, but you were actually working as a uh, backline tech. Yeah, that um, was the only time I did that was with Keith Richards, but right, I did it twice with him. Or I, one of the Neville brothers. Yeah. Uh, and that's where, yeah, Lou Reed, Iggy Pop, Keith Richards. Yeah. Um, but uh, it was interesting how you, you describe everything in your book. I mean, you, you definitely give everybody a, a, a picture of what it really is like to be on the road. Not, not just as a performer, but as a tech um, yeah. as well. And the stories about the unions and how you can't touch things and stuff and how you have to sleep on the bus and yeah uh, i i I paint a pretty a pretty accurate picture of being on the road that's what um the guy that wrote the forward in my book is he mm -hmm. said that he thought that you know he read my book before he wrote the wrote the forward and said he thought it was really authentic of being, yeah uh you know being on the bus and like sometimes things repeat over and over. It's just like you're in Groundhog Day. You're doing the same same thing over and over all the time. You get something slipped yeah. under your door that tells you what you do that day and what time. It's really kind of it's kind of a, a not wild and crazy, but really kind of regimented. Like you're yeah. doing the same thing every day from the hotel to sound check to catering to performing to the bus to the hotel, to the sound check, to, you know, it, it's, it's very, very strict, I guess, is, is the word I'm looking for. But along the way, you're fighting with Shriners, you know, oh, yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, stories come out of left field, things, wacky, crazy things come out of left field. Yeah, I had a thing with the Shriner at Kroger one time, but, <laughs> you know, it, things are tense between me and the Shriners. <laughs> we, we have a, a very, a very tense, uh, 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 what do you call it when uh, you, you, you've got uh, uh, a treaty? We have a tense treaty. I mean, <laughs> again, you just had the trouble with the one. Oh, <laughs> you yeah, know, that yeah. can happen to anybody. Yeah. Um, you mentioned uh, you, you were, you were uh, one of the chapters was the snake pit story. Yeah. Um, and you mentioned Fresco, which I hadn't heard about in a long time. I remember Fresco when I was a kid, kind of grapefruit flavored soda. Oh yeah, it's a great. It was great, <laughs> refreshing. Refresh um, we went to the White House. Yes, Soul Asylum. Soul Asylum. Met Bill Clinton. Met Bill Clinton in the Oval Office. Um, there I am shaking his hand, and Dave Perner's got a smirk on his face because right as I'm shaking his hand, he says he voted for Bush. <laughs> That's so, right. So right, I'm shaking his hand right then at that moment, and he just laughed and shook it off and he was a great guy uh when you when you talked to him you talked like you you were the only person in the world you felt like he's really really dynamic and really really you good guys president. pretend to be the band i'll pretend to be the president <laughs> exactly <laughs> we got to play sax with us and you got to see al gore's office yeah. <laughs> thanks to george stephanopoulos your guide yeah. He was a guide, and uh, he took us to to the other side to see uh, Al Gore's office. And 
encourage us to uh, rifle it. Encourage it. Because <laughs> he was out of and, town. Yeah. He's on a town doing vice presidential things. And so he, he encouraged us to take pens and pieces of paper, a letterhead and all kinds of stuff. He was just laughing about it. And so he was, was telling so, people about the lockbox. <laughs> no. Uh, so was Bill Clinton when Stephanopoulos told uh, him about it. It was, <laughs> yeah. it was all fun. It was all fun. Yeah, a lot of interesting tidbits uh, in your book. Uh, the Dragon Lady <laughs> in that chapter. Yeah, that's true. They called <laughs> Bill Clinton the Dragon Lady and the wife. <laughs> dragon Lady warning. Here comes the Dragon high. Lady. <laughs> we had to hide under the stairs. That was... Uh, <laughs> Um, you like dirty vodka martinis? Yes, I do. That's what I'm drinking now. Oh, uh, too funny. Uh, 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 you, you just get more to drink because it's already a double, and and you know I just like vodka. See, vodka kicks my ass. If you want state secrets, yeah, just just put vodka. Ply me with vodka. <laughs> <laughs> but the production company that created the movie that I wrote, uh, Deadly Species, was yeah. called Dirty Martini Productions. They like dirty martinis. Awesome. I couldn't drink them. I, I love them. I <laughs> or, you know, we're not supposed to drink liquor before the Hank show. But if we were staying at a, a hotel that had a bar in it, I'd sneak down to the bar and drink about two or three dirty martinis before the show, before the show <laughs> and, you know, go on and act like nothing's happening in the van, you know. I'm fine. I when I started doing comedy, I used to do the same thing to yeah. relax before the show. It kind of, you know, gets the spiders off. But it catches up to you. <laughs> yeah, but it will if you do it too much. Yeah, yeah. I, I um, only, only drink when I play, really. Uh, I, I don't do it in the studio and I don't do it other situations. Just yeah. usually to, you know, get loose. And not that much. Um, Clive Davis, Arista Records. Oh, yeah. You want to share that story? You want to move past it? <laughs> well, no, it's... Uh, he, he signed the first band I did, had a record deal with called Witness uh, back in 1986. And he said, well, I'm going to sign... We were playing and he said to our manager, well, I'm going to sign him. I'm going back to the hotel. You guys meet me there. So he was staying at the Ritz Carlton off, off Peachtree and uh, we um, show up and that's the first time I've been in a hotel that nice. And we, we go up to his suite and uh, we're all sitting on a couch and he's in the middle and there's a dinner plate there. or There's a, what I thought was a hors d'oeuvres plate. And uh, he's telling us what he's going to do for us and how he's going to make us stars and stuff. And I reach over and grab, piece of broccoli off of it and dip it in something and, and, and eat it. And he stopped talking and looked at me like I was, you know, for a second, just, you know, then he started talking again and I did it again about five minutes later and he stopped and then we, it went on. He, you know, we, we got signed, we got a record deal. We were all happy and we leave in and the door shuts and our manager, Charlie Brusco goes, almost smacked me on the head. And he said, Joey, what are you doing? And I said, I, I don't know what what was I doing. And he said, you were eating food off Ch Clive Davis's uh, dinner plate, you idiot. I said, I, oh, I just thought it was a deli tray. I'm sorry. <laughs> and then we all just kind of laughed. It was like, well, what are you going to do? You know? And they never let you live that down. <laughs> no, no, because every time something bad would happen, they'd say, that's bad. But not as bad as the time Joey ate off of a Clive Davis's dinner plate. So. It's like Bruce Dickinson needs more cowbell. Yeah. <laughs> and the only thing that will cure it is more cowbell. <laughs> he really regrets doing that sketch now. <laughs> Everybody on the street. Hey, cowbell. We regret. So um, Isaac Hayes. Yeah. I know. That was a strange one. Uh, it was in 1989, I think. He was actually kind of strict with you. He wasn't strict. Uh, he uh, he just, <laughs> I don't want to tell all the stories about the book, but he was just confused. He didn't know my last name. And our first gig <laughs> in the theater in London, 
he were playing and there's another keyboard player too and he played piano so i was just doing like mostly like uh what roads and other keyboard parts he gets to the point where where he d- introduces his aggregation which is mm-hmm. he starts with on, on the left stage left and he I'm on stage right, and he works all his way around through, through the guitar player, the drummer, the, I don't know, horn player, whoever. He gets to me and, and the other guy, and he says, these are the keyboard players. These where those horn parts and flute parts and everything comes from. And on the keyboards, first I want to introduce Joey. 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 He turns around and says, Joey, what's your last name? <laughs> Oh. And, and I, I had totally make it up. Forgotten Huffman uh, uh, when when we knew you in in high with high jinks in Lake City. I just knew you as Joey, the keyboard player. Yeah, <laughs> and Mike, the drummer. Well, that happens to me all the time. It's like like somebody asked me, "Do you know Frank?" And I go, uh, "No, I don't think so. you know the one that produced Miranda Lambert." Oh, Frank! Yeah, I I know Frank. I've known Frank for a long time. <laughs> Um, the Hellhounds. Oh, mo- one of the most fun band I've ever been in. Mm. Uh, that was basically the satellites. It was Rick and Rick. Yeah, uh, you, Randy, Rick and Rick. Yeah, yeah. And uh, we we had a lot of fun. That was about 1990, 92. Mm-hmm. Um, we played uh, the, the Cavern every Sunday night. And uh, that was fun. Uh, I, I, I just called up Rick. Rick Richards one night, one Sunday, and said, "Can I bring my piano down and play with you guys?" And he said, "Sure, mate, come on down." And 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 I did, and I sat through the whole show with them and played the whole show, and I kept doing it every Sunday. And then I was all of a sudden I was a member of the band, <laughs> and we uh, we we played. I was making good money. We were making good money playing uh, frat parties and stuff yeah. on the weekends, and. Uh, this is before the satellites got back together again. So, mm-hmm. you know, we, we, it was, and it seriously, a piano solo in almost every song. I, I was probably the, my top form as a piano player playing with them because I had to just, you know, do a Ian McLagan, Nicky Hopkins kind of solo every song. Uh, in, in one uh, chapter, uh, in the 90s, uh, your grocery list consists of Slim Fast and Powerade. Yeah. <laughs> Did you ever mix them? <laughs> um, not on purpose. <laughs> uh, you know, it, uh, sometimes when you get older, you, know, you, you have to watch what you eat. And, yeah. <laughs> and keep those electrolytes up. I don't know. <laughs> that's that's yeah. still my balances out. You got to keep the electrolytes out, otherwise you're just part farting pink dust, you know. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so. Like like white bread. <laughs> now your wife Kim actually sat down on a couch with Keith Richards and didn't realize it. Yeah. She, <laughs> she asked me later. She says, "Where's Keith?" And I said, <laughs> on the couch smoking a joint with him. <laughs> oh, I didn't know that was him. <laughs> But yeah, that was kind of funny. Um, How do you not recognize Keith Richards? Yeah, with that voice, and you know, it's about <laughs> all the time. Um, you mentioned VCR uh, in '96 is actual, actually visual for cocaine res- residue. Yeah, VCR, which made me laugh. <laughs> VCR, visual for cocaine residue. Uh, <laughs> the other VCRs the- were gone by then. Yeah, C C A V, uh, calm, reassuring voice. Uh, <laughs> that was the look in the mirror. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but that's when no mirror was available. You had to ask somebody. Is there wow. Any, I mean, any uh, uh, VCS or visual cocaine reserve VCR. That was the party lifestyle, though. I mean, yeah, unfortunately. I'm, you know, I had a, I had a epiphany in 2004. Yeah. Quit doing drugs, but man, was it fun? <laughs> and man, was it a lot? 
when it was happening. I I I don't know. I, I talk about it in the book. Uh, I, I self bear. I, I I name names and I, I don't hold back. Mm. But but uh, you know it was fun. It was a party. Yeah. Um, I know that I, I was offered many times cocaine and I, I turned it down every time because I knew I would like it too much and it was expensive. Yeah. <laughs> and so I just, I just never did it. Um, and, well, good for you, man. Good on you. Cause you know, it's just too much fun. And then, but, but, but then in soul asylum, we used to say, um, can you want me to ruin your day? Is that, you know, do you want to get high on coke, Jeez. or or can I ruin your day? Hey, can I ruin your day? You know, <laughs> that was that was the code <laughs> euphemism. Yeah, mm -hmm. doing blow. Yeah, that's why I never tried any any drugs because I have such an addictive personality. Like chocolate for me is crazy. I can't even I can't even give up chocolate. So I always knew, I always knew I was I I, I couldn't try something because that would be my life. I mean, I would just be on coke all day every day lose thousands and thousands of dollars um because once i start something i would just keep going so it's just like you rory just it's, it, <laughs> thank god or else you, you wouldn't have seen me you wouldn't i wouldn't have been able to regulate that i'm, I'm always impressed by people who are able to be around addictive substances and they just kind of regulate it somehow i have no idea how that just happens a little bit uh, that wasn't me i was like give me something i'll do it all the time but I wasn't addicted. I had bipolar. I got by, uh, uh, I, I got diagnosed with bipolar and I was self-medicating. It doesn't mean I wasn't abusing it, mm -hmm. but I was self-medicating. So when it was time to stop, I just stopped. I just set it down. It wasn't a really? big. <laughs> really? Yeah. Wow. A lot of people can't do that. That's amazing. That the is only, really amazing. The only thing I had to wean myself off of was uh, oxyco oxycodone. And that mm -hmm. was when I had a brain tumor and I was on them for four months before the brain tumor. And so I was physically addicted to them. So I had to wean myself off. But other than that, I was able to just set it down, sleep for a few days and, and be fine. Wow. That's impressive. Um, how did, how did bipolar affect you? If you want to talk about it and then the brain tumor, if you want to get into that a little bit. Well, bipolar I have a atypical kind that I'm more manic than depressed. Mm -hmm. and, uh, so it's not so bad for me, except when I do get depressed, it's really bad. I, I like I'll sleep for a week or something, oh, but, wow. but mostly I'm manic and I'm ADHD, ADHD also. So I take medicine for that, which mm -hmm. kind of intensifies my manic feeling. And so I'm pretty much up and doing things all the time. Right. That's, uh, I mean, it, it affects me actually in kind of a good way. Mm hmm. That's uh, interesting. Yeah. So you're not getting too much of the buy part. You're getting more of just the one part, the, the productive part. Yeah. You get productive. You also get a little self uh, absorbed, but, you know, when you start doing the same thing over and over and you don't get anything done, sometimes you feel a little guilty, but mm -hmm. it's, you have to, it has to even out. But right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Can we for go most, through, um, yeah, keep going. For, Sorry. Uh, for the most part, it, it has affected me pretty well. You know, I've been taking the medicine and it works. Mm -hmm. And, you know, as long as I take my medicine, it works and things fine. Wow, that's awesome. That's really inspiring. Um, I was going to say, maybe I can go through a couple of the photos that we didn't get to yet. Okay. Okay, so here you are signing your memoir. Yeah. That's <laughs> dressed the same way I'm dressed today. I know. It, it, it could have been taken today. And then that there's the good. jacket. There's the jacket that Benji stole from you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> one of them. He's probably got more than one leopard skin, I think. Mm -hmm. That's right. <laughs> yeah. That's a great photo. What yeah. year might that have been? That'd be like 2003, 2004. Mm -hmm. I, that's when I had that guitar. and I know where it was taken and who took it. Okay. 
he remembers generations by the guitars he had. I, I believe that. I believe that. There he is. There I am in all my glory. And uh, then this, of course, is you at the White House again, right? No, that's with no? Kevin Kenny of uh, Soul. Oh, that's Kevin Kenny. Okay, that's right. Kevin Kenny of Driving and Crying. Yeah, I'm Kevin's right. amazing. Amazing. Athens, so Georgia is really uh, into him, too. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, Athens is great. I lived in Athens for about a decade. So awesome. I played yeah. the what there and mm -hmm. the Georgia Theater and uh, a few other venues. Yeah, all the all the legends, all the greats, you know, and it's such a tiny town, but it's it's nutrient dense, you know. It is. It is. I mean, uh, great musicians come from there. Absolutely. Well, you're actually in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame with Driving and Crying, aren't you? Yes, oh, he is. Georgia music. Georgia music. I, in Macon, Georgia. I love that. I've been there. They have Otis Redding stuff and James Brown stuff. Some yeah. of the best musicians of all time come from uh, Georgia. Yeah. Incredible. Yeah. That's a huge yeah. honor. Huge honor. B 52s, REM. Come on. Just yeah, Bill Berry. I mean, uh, uh, not Bill Berry. Um, um, the guitar player. I'm so Peter Buck. Peter Buck. Was the one who entered inducted us into the hall. Oh, really? That's great. Wow, that's awesome. Love Sorry, that. Peter, I couldn't remember your name. <laughs> so, he just played uh, the Nuggets, uh, the Nuggets tribute with our friend Billy Vera about a week ago. Oh, cool. Yeah. He, uh, Peter Buck backed up Billy Vera. Very, very cool. Heard that name. Yeah, yeah Billy Vera, he's a friend of the network. We, he's just incredible. He's just wow. And he's still he's seven. He just turned seventy nine, and he still tours and oh, that's plays good. all the time. You know, his best friend is Priscilla Presley, so they do double birthdays every year together. That's his bestie. So great. Just that's, love that guy. He's a sweet guy. I remember that song from the eighties. Yeah, at this moment, at the yeah, what was yep. That? Well, yeah, yeah, that was that was yeah. the, the re-release of it that actually when it became really famous. Yeah, when it was originally released, it just did okay. It was modest, but uh, mm -hmm. when they they had it on uh, what was the Michael J. Fox show? Family uh, ties. It family was a family ties, ties and just yeah, took just, another level. It skyrocketed, just took off. Yeah, and he got mm -hmm. a, a resurgence. Yeah, I did not know that, but that's mm -hmm. interesting. Yeah, I, I, I did not know that. <laughs> <laughs> Little Johnny Cars. <laughs> That's wild. Uh, <laughs> wild. What? Oh. Uh, Matchbox 20. Um, I did that. <laughs> <laughs> it was uh, it was fun. I had a great time with them. Um, um, we toured. I did that first tour of the first record. They actually did that record at my studio. So mm -hmm. I was playing with Soul Asylum at the time. They came in the office and I said, I'm tired of playing with Soul Asylum. I'm you know, I was just bitching and grinding about something, and that that stuck with them because when they could afford a keyboard player, they hired me. And uh, wow, I, I I was there with the meteor meteoric uh, meteoric rise that they had, so it was a lot of fun. You know, I did I did that with Soul Song too. I was with them from the when when they were just starting to where they had their their rise to fame, right. And, that's a good time to be with the band. It's awesome, you know. Now, uh, uh, you, when you're with people for for a long stretch of time, playing with them and stuff, uh, I I don't know if you feel like you get in a rut. I don't know if maybe people you know start to butt heads and argue more. Um, it's hard. I mean, you've been very lucky to bounce from you know from one good group to another. You know. I know luck. Gotcha. Luck was a lot involved. A lot of luck was involved in my uh, in my career being in the right place at the right time when i was asked can you do this i'd say yes even though i didn't know if i could do it or not <laughs> just kept and it just kept on going you know until you bs your way in pardon you bs your way in oh yeah i bs my way in yeah <laughs> i got past the security guard and got yeah I mean, Soul Asylum was opening for Keith Richards, and I started sitting in with them. Yeah. Uh, while they're opening for Keith Richards, because uh, they needed, they were looking for an organ player, and and so and the only other band that opened for Keith 
that tour was Izzy Stradlin and the Juju Hounds. Mm-hmm. And I was touring with them too. Yeah. So both bands that opened for Keith, I ended up touring with. I'm going to play on Izzy's new record next week. I'm still awesome. touring with Izzy awesome. Stradlin. So, yeah. You heard it here forward. first, folks. Yeah. <laughs> Izzy Stradlin's new record. Um, how was it to be on SNL? You were on the Miranda Richards episode. Yes. Back was, when they had Phil Hartman, and uh, it was a great cast back then. Yeah, they had uh, Mike Myers. Yeah. I don't know if... Uh, uh, yeah, baby. Yeah. It, it was... Uh, it flew by. It was, you know, we we uh, rehearsed like one day and then did a run through the next day and then took Friday off and then came back and did Saturday Night Live, did rehearses, cutting out sketches that weren't working. Mm-hmm. You know, the band would have to be there, mostly hanging around. But, you know, just the, the actual actual filming an actual playing on there I and mean, it just seemed like it flew by yeah and then the next thing i know i'm in a car back to the hotel you know yeah or, or to the after show party which was fun but i got out of there i went somewhere i didn't tell and i didn't tell this part in the book but it's kind of uh incriminating myself but i get a phone call I get a phone call from uh, Keith Richards' road manager and said, I'm here at Bobby Keys, the sax player that played sax on Brown Sugar and played with Stones for years. He says, I'm sitting here with Bobby Keys and we need your nose. And I said, what? He says, we need your nose. Here, uh, here's the address. And I went there and a big pile of cocaine on the taxi. And Bobby was leaving the country. (laughs) <laughs> and the next day and he couldn't take it with him oh, so geez. me and tony and him sat there all night and did that blow <laughs> just and, the three of you yeah just the three of us <laughs> and, and uh bobby was telling stories oh and man telling stories he told the story about uh that's in keith's book about him and keith getting busted coming back in the country and they were be in a holding cell and bobby says well let's call mr dole you know, Dole Pineapple, that his house, like at the beginning of the tour. Anyway, they call him and he says, sit tight, boys. And uh, like five minutes later, the phone rang and that security guard like just sat straight up and said, yes, sir. Yes, sir. <laughs> yes, sir. And he got and he went and unlocked the key. It was the governor that called. Yes. Said, let these boys free, give them the drugs back and hold the flight for them. And <laughs> I mean, oh, man. I know from being like busted to like going back in the plane holding for you and getting your dope back to, <laughs> is, is is pretty funny. He told stories getting like their that dope back until they had to go. I think we left some still sitting on the table. Uh, couldn't do it all, but it was a lot of fun. <laughs> oh man! Ah, uh, but that did that did that kind of partying did take its toll on you eventually. Um, it did. And that's why I had an epiphany in 2004, taking a toll. It took a toll on my marriage. It took a toll on me being a good father. It took a toll on, it never took a toll on my playing. You know, I'd always did records. I've been on like 175 records, uh, or more. And even, I mean, there's, it's historic, you know, I can't say I thought I played good or i thought i thought i played better on that but yeah i mean when i'd stay up for two or three days i played totally different and i'm on record play you know having been up like three days on a lot of records that you know it never affected it never got in the way of my career it but, sounded great but, but i realized that it was going to yeah i was at a press pre- precipice yeah where if I didn't change, I was going to go down. So I did. And luckily, uh, things still work for me. You know, I was 
doing great. I was I quit Hank in nineteen or twenty nineteen, right before COVID. I was doing it to record more uh -huh. and 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 to write more, and uh, COVID hit. So for like three years, I've been our studio was closed and everything. The studio moved to a new location in in a. Uh, um, it, near Dallas or, or uh, um, it's, it's out near Smyrna, but we have a new studio, uh, Soapbox Studios, and uh, uh, going to do work there. And that's where I'm going to do, Izzy's going to come, and that's where we're going to do some of his stuff. Mm -hmm. and, uh, uh, and I've been playing recently with a, a band that just plays weekend, and at least my week's open for me. So I can work and things are finally getting to where it's back, mm -hmm. back like it was before. Yeah. Yeah. You, you are an audio guy. I mean, you, you, you set up audio, like you said, for, for Aaron Neville's son, uh, yeah. for his, uh, keyboard setup. I mean, well, you I know, you know I audio. It. Yeah. I rented my gear. So basically he was playing my stuff. So I really knew how to, to mm -hmm. program it and, get the sounds and stuff so not only well, did makes, i paid but they rented my gear every week so so it makes sense that you would have a, a primo studio you know that that big people want to come to and record yeah. it it's you know your audio yeah i mean i've been engineering and producing for for a good 30 years now i've had i'm sorry renee popped in she probably had a question for you no, no, I'm just, I'm here. I want to hear what he's talking. I, I want him to keep going down this train. train. I want to go down because he's so multifaceted. There's so many stories we want to get to. So, Well, I'll talk all day if you let me. Well, I want to know, I mean, be, I want to know what makes somebody good in the studio, what makes somebody good live on stage. Clearly, you can do both. You're a very eclectic performer. You're an eclectic uh, musician generally. There are some people who really just do studio recording and that's their thing and then there's people that sound better live i mean can you weigh in on that a little bit and what makes somebody a great live? i mean dave perner clearly an amazing live performer i saw you guys um ithaca new york or something back in the 90s when i was a teenager five at uh, uh out out in long island uh Ness, um what is it called long island um that that venue out there right I can't, the yeah it was outdoors it was an outdoor yeah. sort of we were like on a thing Jones, yeah Jones Beach yeah it was like yeah it's me and my friends were in a rock band and we went and we saw I mean it's just incredible the energy and of course Dave Perner with the hair and all of that that's a fantastic performer yeah. um and those guys were good in the studio as well as, as yes mm -hmm. as playing you know so they played their own records but you know, solo artists, you know, they get they get session players and mm -hmm. session players are usually a little bit more. They have to make up a part, you know, uh, and 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 uh, like in Nashville, they have just charts with numbers, the number system. And uh, but you have to be a little bit more a better, a little bit better player to play in the studio than you do play live. Live is is completely different you know studio you're under the micro microscope and uh uh you have to have play with feel you know it's hard to play with feel in the studio but you know yeah. the snare is behind the beat i play behind the beat uh mm -hmm. you know a little bit and that gives it feel right. uh playing live you can mask it more you know, mm -hmm. but I love playing live too. It's a different thing, but I love it as, as just as much. That's why I'm tempering being in the studio and producing and doing sessions with playing live because I need both of them to, to keep my sanity. Yeah, right. when you're playing live, you're feeding off the crowd's energy and it's just mm -hmm. a whole different experience, you know. Sure. Uh, so, yeah. Absolutely. Can you um, weigh in a little bit about fame and? sort of, you've been around so many people who have been so outrageously famous. What do you think effect that has on a person, good and bad, that you've noticed? I have noticed, you know, I, I haven't been, you know, I've been around real rock stars. I mean, mm -hmm. I, I've done a lot, but 
and I've seen people really handle it really well. And I've seen people that, that had problems with it, that it got too much for them to deal with. And I don't want to point out which was which, but uh, it, it's definitely a, a burden to be famous. It's hard to be, there's, there's a lot, uh, uh, you know, that you don't think about when you think, God, I want to be famous. I want to be a rock star. Yeah. There, there's responsibility to your fan base, your mm -hmm. fan and your record company. And, you know, I, I just wrote this triple platinum record. Now I've got to write another record. How am I going to do it? You know, how am I going to live up to that? The pressure. It's intense pressure, pressure from all yeah. sides and a lot of responsibility. Yeah. People think of a rock star as being someone, people think of a rock star as being someone who's almost lazy. You think of, uh, you know, um, Russell Brand's depiction of that in Get Him to the Greek or whatever. Yeah. You think of someone who's totally bombed out, but it's actually, you have to be very diligent, very connected, very focused, and it's a lot of hard work and like you said, you're in a committed relationship with your record company, with your bandmates, with your fan base, with lawyers. You are actually hyper, you're almost controlled. It, it's like a, a, a golden palace or a gilded palace. Yeah, there are days there that are like, get him to the Greek. You know, there's, there's <laughs> but then there's days you have to put on your big boy hat, or mm -hmm. your big boy hats and go out and, you know, write a song or, or record or, you know, do publicity, do record signings, do, you know, you can't get tired of your fans. And, you, you know, Rob Thomas was excellent. I went to the mall with him one time, at him and his fiance then, his wife now, and they got mobbed by fans. And he sat there and he signed every autograph. And he answered every question and then went on shopping. And he's one person that I saw handle this so well. He knew yeah. he knew where bread was buttered and he he was, you know, such a good it, it affected him in a positive way. I'll say That's, that. Yeah. Have you been able to kind of keep your anonymity a little bit because you're a keyboard player? Uh, yeah. Um, and not a lead rock singer, you know. I, I, I mean, when Mick Jagger goes out or Keith Richards goes out, yeah, they're going to get mobbed, period. <laughs> right. No. Uh, yeah, I've been be able to keep my anonymity. 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 Uh, aluminum. Uh, aluminum. 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 <laughs> aluminum. I've been aluminum. able to keep my aluminum about me. <laughs> uh, yeah, I've been able to, you know, all I'd ever, I didn't want to be famous, really. You know, I'm probably more famous than I wanted to be, but I just want the respect of my peers. Mm -hmm. and, yeah. and, you know, I just want to have, that. Be, have enough money and be respected by my peers. But then the fame part, you know, that's cool, too. I can handle it. I get embarrassed when I have to sign up for us and stuff, but mm -hmm. uh, I, I'm not used to it. But I'm going to have to get used to it by signing this book. Um, you know, I've been doing book signings and, you know, it's a hard, it's hard to write something different, you know, for everybody. And then my publisher told me, you know, uh, authors just sign their name. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. Been, right, yeah right. You don't have to say all that. Uh, best wishes. You're my yeah. best buddy. Yeah. <laughs> you know, dream big. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Follow so your dreams. Stars, but keep your feet on the ground. <laughs> <laughs> um, talk a little bit about cohesion and the family dynamic that a touring rock band acquires over time. The fighting, the sibling rivalry type feel. Um, how real is that stuff? The spinal tap type depiction of the infighting, the backbiting, and the deep love that a touring rock band acquires over time. Well, I can remember touring with Michelle Malone and Drag the River and uh, us having Spinal Tap on the bus and we'd watch it laugh. Yep. And as the tour went on, we'd, we'd watch it. And then, you know, by the end of the tour, we were, in, we were in L.A. for two months and then got back on a tour bus to limp home. Uh, we 
play it and you go, well, that's just too close to the bone. It's too close to home. <laughs> it's like you, you laugh and you cry, right? Yeah. yeah. It was like we couldn't watch it anymore because that was our, that was that tour. That was that whole band's thing. You know, <laughs> we got home and we played a few shows and did some demos for Arista and then it was over. I mean, was I was there a puppet show <laughs> and uh, everybody was doing something else. Um, yeah, but, but yeah, there is a closeness with mm -hmm. the with the band. You, you you love them like family, and mm -hmm. hell, the one that's not there is getting talked about. You know, mm -hmm. it's uh, it's it's just that way, and, and uh, you know, you 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 connect on stage. You connect playing with each other, and you know, you have good nights. Sometimes you have bad nights, and it makes you feel bad. But uh, yeah, there's a it's a lot like being in a family. And yeah. You stay in touch with most of the people you've played with, though. Yeah, I do. I stay in touch with most all of them. Yeah. T text. Usually text. Yeah. But, you know, like Dave out of the blue wished me Happy Father's Day. And I didn't know that he was, you know, he's thinking about me for a second, you know. And I got a text. Uh, that that kind of made me feel, it made me feel good, you know. I said, well. Yeah. Of course. How do you um, tap into confidence when you're around and you are such a high powered individual in such a high pressure industry? You have to always believe in yourself, be confident because you can't possibly get on stage in front of thousands of people. You can't possibly walk into a recording studio with CeeLo Green unless you have some stores of confidence within your soul. How do you get there? You just have to fake it if you don't. I mean, yep. fake it till you make it. Yeah. Yeah. I, I believe in that. That's a true thing. I, I'll tell you this, swear to God, like with Hank, I'd be standing backstage five minutes before the show. Uh, I already had my drink and something from my reptilian brain was saying, run, run like yeah. hell, get the hell out of here. And, sure. uh, and, but I'd step up on that riser and the, hit the first note and everything was fine. Yeah. It was like, you know, it's like, uh, and dealing with the pressure, this business is hard. You know, you got to be able to tell when people have agendas and, and, you know, not let them get to you. you all you got yeah. is talent and your contacts, really. And people will try to get your contacts and try to get everything they can from you and then just throw you to the side, throw you under the bus. It's a, yeah. it's a vicious business. I, I, yeah. I can't. I really. I was telling somebody this the the other day that that, that I, the business part of it is is really hard, and yeah. sometimes it's hard to shake off and then just and be be uh, you know uh, inspired to do the the art part of it. Yeah, there's a lot of money. There's you know it's the business of show. It's not just show. It's show yeah. business. The people that you've heard of are people who were able to harness talent and entrepreneurship both yes. and also surround themselves with the right people which as you know who you surround yourself and who you trust with your money with your talent with your deals is everything and when you get to a certain degree of fame you're going to have personal people and and business contacts taking advantage of you who are not out for your best interest they are just out to make their own money or be a rock star adjacent for their own reasons if if you let them do it yes mm -hmm. it's it's there you know, I can tell when people have an agenda. I had a weird, I came up with a strange childhood that it, it gave me this, like, if that was my superpower, if, I, I can tell when people have you an have a agenda sixth sense almost immediately and mm -hmm. not have anything to do with them. Right. And or, or I won't involve myself with an artist if I find out or know, and I can usually tell whether they're doing like crystal math or something. Mm -hmm. And you know they're not they're talented as hell, but I, you know I expose myself to that. That's a that's a, 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 a it endangers my sobriety. Yeah. yeah, I agree with that. And then the other thing, which is also like the spinal tap sort of thing, or the Yoko Ono sort of dynamic, uh, romantic relationships that are maybe toxic or abusive they can really eat up a lot of people who are maybe either mentally ill or highly creative or highly sensitive. 
I know a lot of, I'm speaking anecdotally because I've known so many highly talented, sensitive men and women in the arts and they just met the wrong person. And before you know it, they were isolated or addicted and, or, you know, not allowed to, to go on the road anymore, not allowed to have those friends anymore. Um, most people in the arts have those horrible stories where you see somebody I, slipping into that. I do. I've had some toxic relationships and, uh, you know, I knew better, but got into them anyway. And yeah. one of them was the one where I had the uh, epiphany, you know, that, uh, that, that relationship was the one. It was a very toxic relationship around 2000, right after I did CeeLo, I think. Mm -hmm. I, I still kept recording. I didn't, and I was going on the road with the satellites, but it was just such, such toxic relationship that, mm. you know. Were you I, being restricted? Were your movements being restricted? Well, by drug use. Mm -hmm. Oh. By, by drug use, like, they weren't getting jealous that I was playing actually they wanted me to go play but uh, uh it wasn't restrictive but it was toxic and and bad and you know drug buddies and 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 mm -hmm. uh, yeah uh, this is sex and drugs you know i could do without the rock and roll it, yeah right it, i mean it gets to that point so i had to i had to i had to leave yeah, uh, who we spend our time with dictates so much of our emotional health, our physical health, our creative health. And I think some people don't understand that, but I, like you, have learned in my life who I spend my time around is going to dictate what's possible for my life and my future and, and, and my emotional health. So we have to really guard our social circle. And in many cases, it's better to be alone for a while than to be yeah. around the wrong crew, you know? Yeah. Be alone for a little while to, to find myself, to make it to where maybe I am ready to have a relationship again. You know, yeah. it's, I, I was never alone for until I was like way into my forties. Uh, mm -hmm. you, you know, the first time I was, I was always playing in a band. I was always around somebody always, mm -hmm. you know, uh, uh, but you know, after my divorce and, 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 you know, I had my own place. It was hard, but you know, it was needed to be, I needed to have, I'm on my own to get to know myself for real, right. you know, real me, and uh, you know, to grow, to grow some, and you know, to be like now. I don't get angry anymore. I've I've put to bed all my anger by forgiving people and and letting mm -hmm. not, not letting some of them know because the anger is about you. You carry that. Anger. It's your it's your job to set it down. Hmm. and forgive and and so i don't get angry anymore i i'm happy uh i'm not in a relationship right now but i'm happy i'm getting to play i'm getting to work that makes me happy and uh i'm at a good time in my life is so. there anybody or any group that you didn't mention on the show here that you'd like to give a shout out to or mention maybe a, a story of that you would like to relay or? Uh, no, not really. I mean, <laughs> uh, playing with Leonard Skinner was pretty fun, filling in for Billy Powell when he broke his hip. That was fun to get to play Free Bird with the real band. Wow. What it, did that's, that's what I wanted to say to you. I mean, meeting Bill Clinton, uh, you're talking about all these incredible iconic people, including yourself, you are Georgia Music Hall of Famer yourself. So in your own right, you are an icon too. Do you get that weird feeling where you sense being a part of history? Do you appreciate it in that moment? Do you look around when you're playing Freebird with Leonard Skinner and you say, I, I, I appreciate, this is a part of history and I'm a part of history and I'm carrying impact. I, I don't, look at it so much that way i people tell me how much or how historical it is i don't realize it in the moment mm -hmm. uh, i've never really been I've, I've gotten to where i have by because of my talents or whatever and i never really i don't promote myself a lot mm -hmm. um uh, so i never really until afterwards realized 
maybe that that was a big thing you know that 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 was it you know i was always honored to, to fill in for billy powell and and i was always you know thrilled to be playing with but i didn't realize you know to be able to say i played with leonard skinner is a really cool thing but yeah uh, well, even in your book, you make the analogy that you're kind of like the Forrest Gump of rock and roll. <laughs> yeah. I mean, yeah. I mean, things happen to me. <laughs> I really didn't expect you just, that. You, you got into a lot of the right places at the right time. and Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, a month ago, I was pecking for Keith Richards. The next month, I'm on Saturday Night Live. And then that summer, yeah. I'm touring with Soul Asylum. And I'm doing a lot of records with the Meat Puppets and uh, other 90s band you know all of a sudden i'm playing with driving and crying and playing a lot with them while solo Solomon was on break i played with them for about a whole year yeah um and then off and on up till the present you know wow. that's a charmed life <laughs> yeah it is all it, yeah one of the fans right here said awesome career yeah just yeah. It's stunning. If you go to your Wikipedia, like I just did, you know, you go to your Wikipedia and you just say one one thing after another, and it's just incredible. I can't even believe it. I, have I want to put your book up here one more time because uh, yes, um, it is. It is a, it is a great read. I'm a writer too, so it's a great read. I'll tell you right now, he's a very interesting writer, and uh, you wrote this yourself. You didn't have anybody else writing for you. No, uh, my publisher and another editor edited it, but mm -hmm. did all the writing, yeah. Yeah, and no it's, it's entertaining. It's very entertaining. There's a lot of great stories in there. I read a lot. I think I learned to write because I read a lot. That helps. About from 18, because I heard one of the girls say, back when I was young, I used to be a pretty boy. And, you know, he yes, was you were. <laughs> boy. He was a pretty boy with no, you know, that didn't know anything. So... That really, that really, uh, you know, the stupid pretty boy, that really got me uh, reading. I read like every, I had a book all the time. I mean, until recently. Uh, and I read all the time. So I think that's what taught me to write, to be able to write. Because I, I, the same way I learned to play piano was by ear. I learned to write by rote, you know. Yeah. So I'm that's lucky. I'm there's lucky. a lot of there's a lot of pretty well read boys out there too, <laughs> <laughs> and you're one of them. Not pretty so much anymore, but you know, oh, you've I, aged pretty well. Considering what you've done, you've aged pretty well. I the probably, reason Keith Richards is still alive with everything he's done, but hey, you know, do his dad's <laughs> ninety five or something. So, oh man, he's he's going to be around a while. Man, oh man. All right. Well, thank you so much for coming on the show and, and sharing some of your experiences with us. Uh, I'm going to send your book back so you'll sign it to me. Okay. Uh, and uh, uh, you, you you don't have to say, you know, reach for the stars or anything on oh. that. <laughs> Give you a message. <laughs> Renee, thank you for uh, making this all work uh, smoothly as usual. Uh, what did I tell you about using your phone? Good cameras, good, good, Good uh, microphones. Nary a problem. Awesome. So, all right. Again, I'm, I'm looking forward to reading the last 20% of your book that I haven't gotten to yet. Um, I know there's a chapter on your on your uh, surgery to get the tumor out. Oy. Yeah. Joey. Uh, and I'm so glad you came through that okay. I am too. Um, yeah. It's lucky, like I said. Uh, maybe there's something that I need to do that I haven't done yet. So, Maybe that's maybe I have destiny. I don't know. Tom Cheshire, our good buddy, uh, is glad is going to be glad we went overtime. <laughs> and again, thank you again for a wonderful interview. I hope you had as much fun as we did. I had a great time. Thank you guys. Thank you, Renee. We'll thank have you. you on again. I know you got a lot more stories to tell. Okay, buddy. <laughs> All right. Have a good night.